Today is Sexagesima Sunday, the epistle for this Mass here in Peter Peterborough area in England is from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Book 1, chapter 11 and 12. <clears throat> Brethren, you gladly suffer the foolish, whereas yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take from you, if a man be lifted up, if a man strike you on the face. I speak according to dishonor, as if we had been weak in this part. Wherein, if any man dare, I speak foolishly, I dare also. They are Hebrews, so am I. They are Israelites, so am I. They are the seed of Abraham, so am I. They are the ministers of Christ, I speak as one less wise. I am more, in many more labors and prisons more frequently, in stripes above measure, in deaths often. So the Corinthians are being persuaded by the Jews to go back to Judaism, among the Jews there. And the pagans are being convinced towards Judaism by the Jews. So St. Paul is saying all these reasons, don't go back to the darkness of the Jews. Here's what I did to labor to give you the truth. And he goes on. Of the Jews, five times did I receive forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. And night and a day I was in the depths of the sea, in journeying often, <coughs> in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils from my own nation, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils from false brethren, in labor and painfulness, in much watching, in hunger and thirst, in fasting as often, in cold and nakedness. Besides these things which are without my daily instance, the solicitude for all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is scandalized, and I am not on fire. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the th in the things that concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knoweth that I lie not. At Damascus, the governor of the nation under Aretas the king, guarded the city of the Damascenes to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall, and so escaped his hands. If I must glory, it is not expedient indeed, but I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, he's speaking of himself, humbly, I know a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body I know not, or out of the body I know not, God knoweth, such a one wrapped even to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, that he was caught up into paradise, and heard secret words which it is not granted to man to utter. For such a one I will glory, but for myself, I will glory nothing but in my infirmities. For though I should have a mind to glory, I should not be foolish, for I will say the truth. But I forbear lest any man should think of, of me above that which he seeth in me, or anything he heareth from me. And lest the greatness of the revelation should exalt me, there was given me a sting in my flesh, an angel of Satan to buffet me. For which thing thrice I besought the Lord that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for power is made perfect in infirmity. Gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. The Holy Gospel. From St. Luke, chapter 8. At that time, when a very great multitude was gathered together and hastened out of the cities unto him, he spoke by a similitude. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And others, some fell among, upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And others, some fell among thorns, and the thorns, growing up with it, choked it. And others some fell upon good ground, and being sprung up, yielded fruit a hundredfold. Saying these things, he cried out, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him what this parable might be, to whom he said, To you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to the rest in parables, 
but seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, and they by the wayside are they that hear. Then the devil cometh and taketh the word out of their heart, lest believing they should be saved. Now they upon the rock are they who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no roots, for they believe for a while, and in time of temptation they fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they who have heard, and going their way are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and yield no fruit. But that on the good ground are they who in a good and perfect heart, hearing the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit in patience. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. Please pray for the soul of Irma Valesquez. Irma was an old lady. She lives with her sister in Mexico, Laredo, Mexico. And I was able to give both of them extreme unction I think in the spring, last year in the spring. So pray for her soul. She died a few days ago. And her father was a Cristero. Her father was friends of the whole Pro family, where you got Father Pro, Umberto, his brother, and uh, he had a big family. And he knew the family very well, His her father. Her father also was best friends with the lawyer, Luis Segura Vilchis, who, when they were, were arrested, he said to the chief, look, if I tell you who was behind these plans to kill the president Obregon, will you set the others free? Meaning Father Pro, his brother Umberto, and two others. And the chief said, yes, we'll set them free. He's and, of course, Luis Vilchis had nothing to do with it, but he stuck his neck out and said, I'm the one. Let the others free. But he reneged on his promise, and he sentenced all of them to death. So Luis Segura Vilchis was an honor honorable man. He wore his best suit like a wedding on the day of his martyrdom. And they were taken from prison to the shooting range. And Father Pro was martyred first. He extended his arms with a rosary in his hand and, and said, Viva Cristo Rey, and fell, and his soul went straight to heaven. And then after him was Luis Segura Vilchis, who opened his chest. His, he has a crucifix on his chest, and he said, Shoot here, I'll show you how a Catholic dies. So what happened to his best friend, Valesquez, the father of Irma? Well, he says he was sleeping. He slept in. And he missed the meeting that they were supposed to have where they were arrested. So his, his sleeping uh, enabled him, as he said, he missed the crown of martyrdom. He would have been martyred with them. But it also enabled the stories to continue. And we know many insights now that otherwise would have been lost. So, so... This Cristero's daughter just died in her ripe old age. I think she's in her 90s. So pray for her soul, Irma Valesquez, and all her, also her sister, Lourdes, who's still alive. Pray for her as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In this parable, it's rare that our Lord will give the meaning of his own parables, but the disciples insist and it's recorded by St. Luke, who would have received it from uh, St. Uh, Saint, uh, Mark and the other apostles. So our Lord explains very clearly what it is. The, the seed that falls on the ground, the birds that is the devil grabs it up, others are dried up because there's no moisture, that is a soul that doesn't pray, that doesn't give to, to meditation, to spiritual reading, but just gets caught in activity. There's no moisture and it withers away and loses the faith. 
and then uh, the rock that is choked up by the pleasures and interests, temporal needs of this world, they, they lose sight of heaven, and they lose the faith and fall away. They're choked out, suffocated. But the good ground are they who, in a good and perfect heart, hearing the word, keep it and bring forth fruit and penance. The good and perfect heart, what is that? To have a good will, to please God in all things. That's a grace we have to ask for. And a perfect heart, to love God above all things. That's a grace we must beg for. To love God with all our heart, all our strength, all our will, our, all our capacity. We're not born with these things usually. We have to pray for these graces. An increase of these graces. And it's true by sanctifying grace, you have faith, hope, and charity, and all the virtues are in us. All the gifts of the Holy Ghost are in us. But we have to, like a garden, nourish it, manure it with humility and humble prayer and contrition and confession, and uh, study with the sunlight of doctrine, know our catechism well, know the faith well, and especially the battle of our faith now. With modernism, liberalism, Vatican II, the New Mass, the whole onslaught against our Catholic faith, we got to study and know why, why we're doing what, what we're doing and what the saints brief, before us did. And we have to also have the reign of God's grace. The prayer of the humble man, says St. James, pierces the clouds, but God rejects the, the, the proud. So we must be very humble of heart. Know that we are dirt. And God has planted in a, the dirt of our bodies the, and in our soul the seed that is the holy Catholic faith. And we must thank God every day. I think most of us here and maybe our hearers too were baptized Catholics. And it's a great grace to receive the faith in our mother's arms. It's a tremendous grace. And it's also a grace for converts to come to know the Catholic faith. It's an incredible grace. Archbishop Lefebvre used to say that all the time. We must thank God for the grace of, of professing the Holy Catholic faith because many don't and many don't have that chance. However, God does give sufficient grace to everyone to save their soul. That was denied by the Jansenists. But it's true, God does give everyone sufficient grace to save their soul. That goes for Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, and all them. And it's a mystery of God's grace. They cannot be saved in their religion, their false religion. They cannot be saved. But God alone can read the heart if they're contrite. And if, they, if all their, in all their heart they want to know the truth, and they would willingly be baptized, willingly study the faith, willingly embrace the Holy Catholic faith, God alone can read that. And Mother Church does teach in her ordinary magisterium the, what's called the tremendous grace of baptism of desire. And, and that doesn't mean everyone's saved if they're just nice and desire it. No, it's not the same thing. But the Church is quite specific what it means. But anyway, there is some ground there for salvation through the Catholic Church through the grace of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and will only know those souls in heaven. So with a good and perfect heart, hearing the word, keep it and bring forth fruit. And then our Lord adds, adds a key, two words to that, in patience, in great patience, that we work out our salvation in patience. And you see, uh, and elsewhere, our Lord refers to receiving a hundredfold also. He does this in a, in a number of parables. Elsewhere, remember, he said, everyone that left, that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall possess life everlasting. So what is this hundredfold? It is the rewards even in this life that God gives. And remember the Virgin Mary herself had to leave her house at three years old to go to the temple. 
For a child of three, that had to be a tremendous sacrifice, not only for her, but for St. Anne and St. Joachim. So she left house. She left brethren and sisters, her father and mother, to give her life to God. And at age three, she already consecrated her whole life to God perfectly. Or who leave wife or children or lands for my name's sake, our Lady left her relatives to flee to Egypt with St. Joseph and the child Jesus. And so Our Lady fulfilled the sacrifices perfectly. Let's see what Father Cornelius Alapides says about this. It's worth our, our contemplation here. Who has left house, either because he has been despoiled of his house, and been driven into exile by a tyrant, such as Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, such as many Catholics driven out by, at times of persecution, or because he has voluntarily given up his house on account of the scandals and temptations which he has found in it, or because he has left his house and fled to a monastery or church or seminary in order to give himself up entirely to the service of God. I say the same thing concerning brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, for when they are unbelieving and wicked, they make it their business to draw a believer from faith and righteousness. So yes, I do know a vocation, a monastic vocation, that had to, in Vietnam, he had to flee out of his house at four in the morning through his window because his parents were going to block his coming to the monastery. And that's what he did. When we, he arranged the escape with a car with his friends, got on a plane and came to the monastery in when it was very solid uh, in Silver City, the Benedictines with Father Cyprian. So he had to flee his family. And St. Jerome says, if a father or a mother lie down in front of the monastery or seminary or convent to block a vocation from from going in when they have a true vocation saint jerome says respectfully step over your father and fulfill god's will that's what he says we must love god above even our family and this is what our lord is talking about therefore if a wife draw away from her husband from faith and piety christ advises the husband to be divorced from her for it is better to desert a wife than to desert christ so, um, obviously, if you're married, you're married till death, and you must fulfill the duties of marriage. But there are some rare cases in history, such as uh, the brother of St. Bernard, Guy, who is uh, blessed. And it's a rare case, but if a husband and wife agree, perfectly agree between each other, to go higher and give their life to God, it has been permitted in the history of the Church. But it's rare, because although one spouse might want to enter a convent, the other spouse wants to, doesn't want to, and, and wants to keep their marriage vows, and all that comes with it. Well, then she can't. It would be a sin for her, or he, to abandon their marriage vows to go higher. So both must agree, and it must be under the wise discretion of a spiritual father. But voluntarily... They leave the same who from zeal for the more perfect life flee to the cloisters of religious orders. This is the meaning of my name's sake, for the sake of me, and love and reverence for me, Christ is speaking, that they may better and more fully serve me and give themselves totally. And this is the consecrated life of nuns, monks, priests, brothers, they shall receive a hundredfold. Listen to these beautiful words. In Greek, the word for a hundredfold is a hundred of each. So you're going to receive a hundred of each. House, brother, sisters, wife, mother. What does all that mean? Here he explains. So that instead of one house, which he has left for Christ's sake, his family, he will receive a hundred houses for one brother, sister, Son, father, mother, he would receive a hundred brothers, sisters, children, fathers, mothers. And this is very true. He explains this. 
In the Syriac, it says one into a hundred, augmented and multiplied by a hundredfold interest. You will ask, what is this hundredfold which is promised to those who have left their possessions for Christ? First, he gives some errors, but let's jump, jump right to the truth. He shall receive a hundredfold, says St. Gregory the Great, because God shall take care that such a one shall rejoice far more in his poverty or his renunciation of his goods for the love of Christ than rich men rejoice in all their riches and advantages. And this, these who give up their possessions for Christ's sake, do indeed experience. And granted, you know, most, most of you are not monks and priests and are not going to be. But you've had to make a similar sacrifice. We all have had to. I had to leave my wonderful brotherhood of the Society of St. Pius X when they went conciliar. And that was very painful because that's our family. But when they compromise on the faith, what are we supposed to do? We must love Christ above compromise. And so uh, you also, the laity, who see, with you have the grace to see, which is a grace, this compromise, and that we're not, we cannot compromise an uncrowned Christ and go with compromise with the new Mass in Vatican II and the and the new code of canon law, and all the, the new profession of faith, and all the agreement to be silent, the secret silence now imposed by the new SSPX, by their agreements with Rome, now they're put in a, their, their mouths are duct taped. It's true. So you had to leave also your parish, your friends, relatives. And I know many families all throughout where we have our missions, mostly in the United States and Canada, and here in the, 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 the suffering families have had to go through. Real suffering. The, the price, like monks do when they leave their family to go to a monastery. They're, they're rejected by their own relatives, rejected by their friends. They no longer uh, have contact. They're cut off. And this is painful. But why follow this path? For our Lord's sake. For our Lord's sake. And none of us asked for Vatican II to happen. None of us asked for Pope Pius XI and XII to ignore Our Lady's request to consecrate Russia. And they ignored her. Because they ignored her, we got Vatican II in the new Mass. And total devastation. And none of us asked also for Bishop Fillet to compromise and overthrow the principle of, two, of the general chapter of 2006, he overthrew that principle and replaced it with a new one. He had no right to do that. And then that principle was no agreement with modernist Rome until Rome comes back to tradition, uh, and until there's a, an agreement on doctrine. And he threw that out to the rubbish bin, as you say. He threw it out and replaced it with now's we have to adapt a new attitude towards Rome. And then none of us asked for, um, you know, the novel teachings out of Broadstairs. We, none of us asked for this. Archbishop Lefebvre never taught that the new Mass gives grace, that the new Mass first nourishes your faith. In fact, he said the very opposite. So none of us asked for these things. But what do we do when we're faced with them from our superiors? We must respectfully oppose them, pray for them, do good to them, feed them, give them to drink, but oppose their erroneous teachings. And that's all of us have had to share in this beautiful invitation of our Lord, who will abandon father, mother, lands, house for my sake. For the sake of the Catholic truth, you will receive a hundredfold. Saints Jerome and St. Bede the Venerable and others take a hundredfold to apply not to temporal, but to spiritual goods, such as peace, joy, divine consolations, and all other gifts and graces with which God comforts them and which he heaps upon them. Isn't this true? Imagine the joy of St. Joseph and Our Lady in Bethlehem, rejected by all, but yet they're so happy because... The divine child is born in utter poverty, 
and the angels rejoice and the shepherds come. So what happiness, and what happiness for priests? Priests who have are, are monks, like Father Victor Moroz in Buffalo. He was a son of St. Maximilian Kolbe for 14 years. He worked as a brother in Poland. And he ended up in Japan and met the priests, excuse me, met faithful who had not seen a priest since St. Francis Xavier. And long story short, he ended up in Buffalo, New York, where he continued the Tridentine Mass. He was kicked out by his provincial, he was a Franciscan, and he kept the Tridentine Mass in chapel in Buffalo, and he died in 92, and he left his chapel to the Society of St. Pius X, which was strong in those days, and good in those days. And so, you know, here he is, kicked out, booted out, but he was happy, because he stood on the truth, he stood on the true doctrine. But while those priests and those brothers who went along with compromise, they become bitter, miserable, and unhappy, because they know they're not loving Christ with all their heart and strength, we used to see this as young seminarians and priests in our cassocks going to uh, our parish churches or visiting priests, visiting churches. The old priests who knew the Latin Mass, they hated us. They hated to see the Lefebvre's in their cassocks. They hated it. And they were rude and often obnoxious and, and even vengeful. Why? Because the, tr the young traditional seminarians and priests remind these old priests of what they turned their back on, the traditional faith, the traditional Mass. So St. Jerome and Bede say, These things surpass all other earthly goods and joys, for more than a hundred exceeds unity. But because St. Mark particularly explains a hundred times as many by adding houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands, it follows that, and more correctly, Origen, Theophilactus, who was the disciple of St. John Chrysostom, Euthymius, Cassian, and Franz Lucas, explains the hundredfold thus, that the man who forsakes his possessions and friends for Christ's sake shall find that Christ, the Sacred Heart, will provide that he find a hundred, that is, very many others who will give him the love, help, and concern of brothers, wives, and mothers with far greater sweetness and charity, so that it shall not seem that he has lost or left behind his own possessions, but has only deposited them in Christ's providence, where they seem to have multiplied at great interest. So think of Archbishop Lefebvre abandoning his own country, France, his family, to become a priest, and then goes to, South Af to Africa, Gabon, an immense sacrifice, but he, he obtained new houses, new brothers, new sisters. The, black, the blacks in Africa became his beloved family, and he loved the Africans. You can, you can hear it in his sermons when he speaks of them, how they were so zealous for the faith, and the catechumens going out to the tribes to teach the faith. So he obtained children and lands. Christ rewarded him as he does all who give for, for his sake. Father Cornelius says, For spiritual affections are sweeter than natural ones. How many of you have met your own family, and it's a little, you know, friction at Thanksgiving or Christmas time? It's not all peace and joy, but you meet fellow traditional Catholics from another side of the world, and it's as if you knew them all your life because of the bond of the faith. For spiritual affections are sweeter than natural ones, and sometime someone who is strong in heavenly love, which piety has brought about, loves more than one who is imbued with an earthly love, which is innate in nature. Therefore, he who has left one home for Christ will find a hundred and more homes of pious people open and ready to receive him with love and gladness. Priests and those who flee from their homes on account of the persecutions in Japan and in England and Scotland know this by experience. And priests of uh, the, the persecution of Vatican II. My whole priestly life has been that of the Society of St. Pius X. And I've been in probably thousands of homes of faithful. I abandoned my home but discovered many more homes and 
open homes to receive the priests. And this was true for Father John Girard, Saint, Saint Edmund Campion, and all those English martyrs, they went from house to house. St. Margaret Clitheroe risked her life having the priest come to her house and say Mass in York. She was betrayed, captured, arrested, and crushed to death. And she said before the judges, if I could ha house a, a thousand more priests, I would gladly do it and die a thousand more deaths. They find the houses of all the faithful open to receive them to hospitality, and they are frequently migrating from house to house. So too a religious monk or priest or brother who has left one house of his father for Christ's sake finds a hundred, not houses, but colleges and monasteries throughout the world to, to be received as at home, very great and fair to receive him with maternal tenderness. So also he who has left one field for Christ will find a hundred fields of the worshippers of Christ by which he may be fed and that without labor or toil, whereas he would, have ha he would have had to cultivate his own land. In like manner for one brother forsaken in his family, there will be many, very many Christians who will cherish him with fraternal love and cleave to him more sweetly with spiritual attachment. And that's true when you leave your brothers at home, you discover many brothers in the monastery or seminary or sisters in the convent. They become closer than blood brothers and sisters. For one sister, very many maidens will chastely love and respect him like a brother. Instead of one father, very many elders will cherish him as a son. For one mother, many matrons will look out for his needs with maternal care. For one, how many, how many good ladies have done the priest's laundry on his travels and prepared meals for the priest? And when you receive the priest, it's receiving Christ. So you're going to receive the reward of, re of feeding Christ, of washing Christ's laundry, of sewing his holy socks and shirts and buttons that blow off his cassock from all the travels. You've done it to Christ. And some of you, some people have burnt many miles and gone through vehicles, driving the car priests around. And that will be rewarded in heaven, as done to Christ himself. For one mother, many matrons will look out for his needs and maternal care. For one wife, so a priest gives up the beauty of one wife and a thousand children, to marry Christ, to marry the Holy Trinity and Our Lady. He'll have a hundred wives of others united to him in chaste spiritual bonds who will be ready by means of themselves and others to care for him in sickness and attend to his needs just as lovingly as though they were his own wives. And I know many cases of good traditional priests in their old age, abandoned by their diocesan bishops and brothers and good laity take them in and take care of them till they die. I've seen that in many cases. And God will bless these good people. Lastly, instead of a single son or daughter, innumerable children will they have, who will revere him as a father and depend upon him and his sound doctrine and counsels, from whom his mind will derive greater pleasure than he could from even his own children. This is what St. Augustine says from Solomon, For the faithful soul there is a whole world of riches. And Cassian says, you shall receive a hundred times as many brothers, fathers, and relations. Whoever has despised the love of one father or mother or child for the sake of Christ's name passes over to the most sincere love of all those who serve Christ, and instead of only one, finds many fathers and brethren bound to him by a more fervent and excellent affection. Whoever renounces one house for the love of Christ shall be enriched by the possession of multiple houses and fields, and by right he will have access to innumerable monastic residences in all parts of the world, as though they were his own houses. How can it be denied that he receives a hundredfold, or if it is permissible to add something to our Lord's saying, more than a hundredfold, when someone leaves behind the unfaithful compulsory ministrations of ten or twenty servants, and is then supported by the voluntary obedience of so many free men and nobles. 
So says Cassian. So how many beautiful examples of saints who have left father, father, mother, family, lands, brothers, sisters, for our Lord's sake, and are now not only possessed a hundredfold in this life, but they now possess eternal life. So what a beautiful invitation of Christ to all of us. And this applies now very much to the laity, those who enter, who join the resistance. They're the bad ones. They're looked upon as rebels and renegades and uh, integrists. But no, we're not. We're just simply Catholic. That's all we want to be. That's all. But no compromise. That's all. And Archbishop Lefebvre, look how he was treated, as so-called excommunicated, which was null and void, suspended unjustly, tr trampled upon by the world and the media. But he gained the whole world. His work spread throughout the entire world, from Asia to Canada, Australia. And he traveled, and Archbishop Lefebvre traveled to give confirmation and ordinations and establish priories, and so forth. So this is the work of a zealous soul, lover of souls. So pray in this Mass that God will raise up an army of saints, an army of generous souls who will gladly leave, perish, to follow the true faith and not compromise in the compromising parishes of the new SSPX and Christ the King Institute and St. Peter's and so forth. Because they all have to compromise. And in adult parishes, they have to compromise on the faith. And when you leave them, you're cut off. You're hated. You're despised. But blessed be God and rejoice when these crosses come your way. And, and return their, their despisings with prayer and not with bitterness. And as our Lord tells us. So let's pray to the Mother of God to fill her army with generous souls to reconvert this world, reconvert England. Ireland, Wales, Scotland, to back to the faith, reconvert. Well, America is yet to be converted, and Canada. That there be many laborers in the vineyards of our Lord to save souls from hell and lead armies, many, many, to heaven. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.